counts of an indictment, uh, neglect of a dependent resulting in serious bodily injury, which is a level three felony. The maximum penalty on that is 16 years. Neglect of a dependent resulting in bodily injury, which is a level five felony. Maximum penalty is six years. Neglect of a dependent with uh, deprivation, a level five felony. Again, maximum penalty is six years. And neglect of a dependent as a level six felony, uh, which uh, range of punishment is six months to two and a half years. The grand jury did return a no bill on two different uh, counts. Uh, but they did return a true bill on four uh, items, which I just mentioned. Uh, I think it's important to recognize everybody that we were able to work with on this case. Uh, I want to give a, a huge thank you and shout out to Detective Erica Jones with IMPD. Uh, this case was a monster in terms of the number of witnesses, the amount of evidence, the complexity of the case involved. And she did a great job of helping us put that together. I want to thank Chief Taylor and Chief Adams for giving us all the resources that we needed to be able to move forward uh, and present this matter to the grand jury. Uh, this was a total team effort. I want to thank Marion County Sheriff uh, Kerry Forstall for all the energy and effort that he put into this case. He also provided additional resources to help us not only locate witnesses, but make sure that everybody was able to appear before the grand jury and also worked uh, very hard in helping us locate individuals. Uh, and I want to thank the prosecutors involved. Uh, Daniel Harrison, who's head of our grand jury unit, Amber Collins, Gabbert Hewitt, Katie Milnick, and my good friend, uh, Ann Frangus. All of those deputy prosecutors worked incredibly hard on this case, worked uh, with Detective Jones to put us in a position uh, to take this matter and present this matter to the grand jury last week. Uh, I want to thank the grand jurors. This was a, a long process, uh, and they were uh, engaged and attentive. And we want to thank them. Uh, as everybody knows, we are somewhat limited in what we can say because this matter was presented uh, to the grand jury. Uh, as you can see from the grand jury indictment, we have a number of witnesses who were listed uh, who will be involved or we anticipate being involved uh, when this matter moves forward uh, to trial. Uh, and uh, we're just very thankful for everybody's willingness to come forward and, and help us and assist this. Um, one of the things that we always consider uh, when you are trying to make the determination as to what's the, the appropriate way to resolve a case or approach a case or handle a case, uh, you know, the grand jury is always an option. Uh, and I think the grand jury is uh, particularly helpful, number one, because you can compel uh, individuals' presence uh, through the uh, judicial process. You can make sure that people show up to, to testify and participate in that process. The other thing is it gives us access to a judge. Uh, and provides an opportunity for us to bring individuals in front of a judge if there are issues uh, with particular witnesses in terms of are they a witness or should they potentially be a target. Uh, we are able to use the judicial process to get individuals appointed counsel uh, and have counsel assist uh, those individuals so they understand their rights prior to testifying before the grand jury. Uh, and so uh, with that, uh, to talk a little bit about the investigation, I'll turn it over to Chief Adams. Good morning. Uh, as Chief or as uh, Prosecutor Mears just uh, alluded, I wanted to also thank uh, Detective Erica Jones, who was uh, involved with this case from the very beginning, but um, she was not the lead. She ended up being the lead once the lead detective retired. And so she's chased down so many um, uh, leads, chased down so many information from the community. Uh, and, she, and as uh, Prosecutor Mears uh, alluded to earlier, this was a team effort. Uh, and I would like to thank the Marion County Prosecutor's Office for having the strength to go to a grand jury. Um, that is one of the options that the prosecutor has, and I'm glad he was able to uh, elicit that in this particular case because it, it, it resulted in an outcome we think is just and fair. So um, I would also like to thank all those from the community that came forward with information. Some of that information was helpful, uh, some of it not. Uh, because obviously chasing down theories, chasing down uh, you know, what people believe occurred takes in a tremendous amount of resources and a tremendous amount of time from our detectives. Uh, she was very diligent in doing that, but obviously chasing down all of those uh, from Facebook and all the, all the uh, information that was coming in was very time consuming for our detectives. Uh, as just, as, uh, just as of last week, uh, we were chasing down other leads. And so I'll finish with this, that this case is not over. It will continue as leads continue to come in. We will continue to chase down those leads. But I would ask and urge the community to come forward with legitimate information as opposed to theories. Chief Taylor. So this is one of those cases that, uh, you know, whenever a child goes missing for uh, any reason, whether they've walked off or they just,
just in, in this child's case, too young to walk off. Something had to happen there. It grabs the imagination and the heart of this community. And uh, that was evident from the, from the get-go. Uh, so many people wanted to help, help in searching for this child, uh, helping, as Deputy Chief Adams said, with theories on what they thought happened. Uh, we really appreciate and we appreciate being at this point uh, with this grand jury indictment, uh, and we, we hope that uh, we can give baby Amaya justice. Well, I mean, I think one of the things is the, the, the grand jury considered all of the evidence uh, that was available uh, you know, for us to present, and this is the, the indictment represents their conclusion. I think the other thing that uh, you know, we, we are all alluding to the fact is, to this point, we still have not found the body. Uh, and I think the, the one thing that uh, I would make clear to everybody is uh, you know, if we're in a position where we are able to locate uh, the baby, if we are able to locate that child, Nothing precludes us from filing additional charges or additional information. Uh, as Deputy Chief Adams just, just spoke, I mean, this is open in the sense that people are continuing uh, to look for uh, the child, and we're hopeful that at some point in time we'll be able to find uh, the baby, but at this point in time we have not located it. What activities did you two spend in the case that warranted these charges? Well, I mean, that's, that's, you know, I can't speak for the grand jury, but ultimately that was the determination made by the grand jury. Uh, you know, and I think the, the charging information very clearly lays out uh, the, the theory that was presented in the sense that if you have uh, care of a child uh, and you assume that responsibility, uh, then ultimately uh, you are responsible for what happens with that child. And I think the charging information of the grand jury indictment reflects that. Did you try for a murder indictment? Well, we can't talk about that, but there were two no bills in this particular case. I can't tell you what the no bills are. Well, it, it, I think this case is unique in, in the sense that the, there was there was never like one moment or one issue that that maybe pointed the, the case in one direction or another. I, I think the biggest thing for us was when we got to the point where we could sit down and digest everything that took place. Uh, and be able to say, okay, now we can establish a firm timeline and now we can map out exactly what, what occurred. Uh, and so for us, you know, from the investigative standpoint, from the prosecutor standpoint, you're continuously following up at leads. Uh, I think it was actually January of this year, we kind of made the decision, we're gonna start building and working towards the grand jury. Uh, and so with that, you're, you know, one of the biggest things, anytime you're dealing with a complex investigation, what you're trying to do is establish that timeline of events. Okay, when did these events occur? What pieces of physical evidence do we have? What pieces of testimony do we have? And how can we put all that together to create a timeline of events that's hopefully digestible uh, for a grand jury to make a determination? Uh, you know, we can't talk about what was specifically presented, but uh, I don't think, I, I think one of the things we can talk about is the, the number of locations IMPD searched throughout this process, the number of witnesses they talked to, uh, the, the incredible number of pieces of physical evidence that were uh, examined uh, during the process of this investigation. You have all of that. Now you have to be in a position to present it in a way and synthesize that information that hopefully makes sense uh, to put it forward for, for the, the, the grand jury. Uh, I think the other benefit that we had in this case was the sheriff's office did a really great job in terms of helping us locate uh, all of the people that we needed to talk to uh, so the grand jury was in a position to make an informed decision. Well, we're, you know, obviously we, we feel like the grand jury has made the indictment, which is kind of that initial presentation to people in the community. The, the grand jury is comprised of people in the community, and obviously they thought these were the appropriate charges to file. Uh, I think the other thing, too, is every time there's something uh, involving this case, we receive a ton of new information, a flood of new information. And so hopefully we'll be in a position to, to hopefully locate the baby. I mean, I think that's what everybody up here wants. Uh, and if we do that, that certainly changes the complexion of what we're able to file or what we're able to prosecute. Did the grand jury testimony shape you any information, any accounts that you did not have before this before the grand jury? I, well, I, I, I think anytime you get people under oath and you bring them in to testify and they understand uh, the consequences of not providing truthful information, uh, certainly 
it, it has a tendency to give uh, the, 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 the most fullest account of, of what occurred. Uh, and, and so I, I, I certainly think that uh, that's always helpful uh, when you're interviewing witnesses or people who are maybe potentially reluctant to cooperate during the proceeding. What is the status of Mr. Lyons? Uh, he currently is still being sought after. Uh, he is in touch with uh, an attorney, and so we're hopeful that uh, he'll get in touch with the sheriff's office and, and surrender himself very soon. Sure. So what that means is information is presented to the grand jury, and the grand jury is given a number of options in terms of what they can charge or what they cannot charge. Uh, and a no bill means that the grand jury found that they do not find probable cause for the following charges, which is a no bill. Obviously, in this case, when they returned a, 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 the indictment on four charges, the grand jury has found that there is probable cause for these four charges. Chief Adams, if Lyons is watching right now, what's your message? Yeah, again, I would ask him to surrender himself, uh, get a hold of family members, get a hold of faith-based, and surrender himself because obviously he knows that there, there are criminal charges that are pending against him, and so he needs to be uh, he needs to be brought in and and processed and and uh, you know held accountable for what he's been charged with. Well, I think based on uh, evidence, based on testimony, uh, we have a timeline. Uh, unfortunately, that hasn't led to the discovery of Baby Amaya. Uh, we're hopeful that going forward, uh, we'll continue to get information that will lead us to the discovery of Baby Amaya. But I think what we've put together in terms of the physical evidence, in terms of the testimony, and in terms of the forensic evidence gives us a good timeline of what, what occurred. Uh, as I said earlier, just a couple weeks, uh, just about a week ago, uh, we got some information, a lead information, uh, crime tippers information that uh, there uh, would be a, a specific location. And so we went out with uh, search and rescue dogs and, and tried to discover anything that would help us in this case. Uh, unfortunately, that turned up uh, not to be anything that was relevant to this case. But as I said earlier, as those tips, as information continues to come in, We'll continue to track down those leads and hopefully determine, you know, help us find uh, Baby Amaya. Any other players in this case that you Well, you know, I, I think as, as the chief mentioned, I mean, this is an ongoing and open in investigation. And I mean, if we find newly discovered evidence or additional evidence, certainly that could lead us to additional individuals. Uh, certainly right now, the, the grand jury has saw fit to uh, indict two individuals uh, based on the information that was presented. But uh, I think all of us are hopeful that at some point in time, uh, they'll be able to consider additional evidence and additional information, which could involve more people. Well, we can't speak to, you know, who, who, who may or may not, but certainly they have uh, the same rights as anybody else under the system.